Hello everyone, welcome to day two of the Landing Festival. Welcome back anyone who was here yesterday as well. Um, we've got a range of talks on the stage today, going right through until the evening. Um, so we'll kick off for, with a talk for any data scientists in the room. Um, I'd like to welcome uh, Mohammed from Apple, who's going to talk about how to become a data scientist at Apple. Big round of applause, please. Hola, everyone. Good evening. Thank you so much for having me to this beautiful city, Lisbon. Um, I'm so lucky to be here. I just arrived to Portugal like an hour ago, so I was literally running to the, to the venue to get here right on time. Well, first of all, congratulations for making it to round of 16, and uh, wish you guys best of luck. Even though our national team, Iran, was very close to making it to round of 16, as you can see here, right? But, but anyway, best of luck. I wish Portugal defeats Uruguay to tonight, and, uh, and you make it to the next round. All right, here's uh, the outline of my talk. Uh, I'll try to be, finish right on time so that you guys don't get bored. Uh, first, I'm going to get into some introduction about data science and what is what does a data scientist do these days, and why is it so popular? And then the rest of the, the parts and uh, outlines are going to be some very cool applications of data science in different domains. Uh, we're going to talk about like data science and IoT. Uh, we're going to talk about how, how data science can save lives uh, in healthcare, uh, detection of malaria, and also doing some predictions, and also in market analysis. Uh, how you know, organizations and companies use data science to save money, okay? Who's a data scientist? A data scientist is a dude who does data analysis and lives in California. That's what a lot of people think of, but that's just a joke. Uh, a data scientist is someone that is c able to connect the existing data in a company or organization to solving problems. So solving problems could be either like saving lives, improving healthcare, or saving money in a company. And so that's the major, the main role of a data scientist. The data scientist should be able to understand the right data and know all the techniques and methods in order to connect that data to solve these kind of problems. The, the reason that data science is so hot, and it's a very hot job these days, is the term of big data. I know everyone is sick of this term, but, but it's real. There's so much data. Just to give you some numbers, uh, there's 2.5 quintillion bytes of data produced every day. Uh, that's a lot, okay? And, um, and something that is even more surprising is that 90% of uh, the world's data today has been created in the past two years. Just imagine what's gonna happen in the next few years. The amount of data that is being generated is exponentially growing every day. If we all, let's quantify it in a different way, just to show how much data we have in one day, generated in one day. If you burn, do you, does that ever, anyone remember what these guys are? This is, these are DVDs, remember? So if you bring all of the data created in one day onto DVDs, you can uh, stack them up to, on each other from, from the Earth to the Moon twice, okay? So again, so much data. So when we get into big data, I'm gonna tell you an old joke. Some guy was looking for his keys during the night under the light, and a policeman was crossing by and decided to help this guy to find his keys. So they started you know, searching around to find the keys like for an hour, and the policeman says, are you sure you lost your keys here? And the guy says, no, but this is the only place that light is shedding, okay? Now, the same thing happens and applies to big data. Many companies and organizations think that wherever they have big data, let's go and, big, let's go and dig out the data. That is not true. In a lot of cases, that is absolute waste of time. Uh, in, in other words, understanding the right data uh, that you need for, for solving your needs and your problems is, all, is a, a challenge a lot of times. And you know, many companies and organizations spend tons of money, time, resource for collecting the right data that they need. That's a true fact. Where, where does all this big data come from? We talked about like 90% of the world's data has been generated in the past two years. What has changed? Here's the answer. Hey, Siri. Good morning.
The answer is, is what? IoT, Internet of Things. The definition of IoT is um, all, like a whole system which has devices that have sensors in, in order to be able to sense the environment and also have to be able to communicate with each other. That's why they have to be connected to the Internet. That's the, you know, the true definition of IoT. After this, we're going to get into some examples and some real projects which are going on right now. I mean, some of them are going to be, you will see that are going to be launched in like seven, eight years from now. Uh, let's see, look into like how IoT and data science can help us live a better life. Uh, well, let's first get into sensor data and talk about like how important sensor data is because it's able to measure a lot of uh, cool things and give a lot of valuable information to us. This is again a real project that happened uh, in, in Netherlands uh, last year. Uh, a local restaurant wanted to use big data and data science to uh, increase their revenue. Uh, what they did was they used this EMF sensor, electromagnetic field sensor, which is able to detect uh, the presence of a cell phone. And uh, they installed this in front of their store in order to monitor the number of people that are crossing by their store over like 24-7. And after like two months, they looked into, they plotted the number of people and they saw there's like a huge peak after 10 p.m. The reason was because there was a pub next by, next door, and people were going to the pub. And this local restaurant was closing at 7 p.m. So that means that it was missing a lot of potential customers. All they did was they expanded their working hours for three hours and the revenue doubled in one year, that easy. And the, you know, the price for the CMF sensor is 25 bucks. You can get it from Amazon, it's very cheap. This is something that I'm planning to do in the future if I become jobless. I'm just going to grab one of these sensors and go and install it different places, you know, get this information and sell this information to local uh, places. All right. How many people know what time series data is? A few? All right. So time series data is any data set which you have time stamps on the x-axis. I'm going to give you some examples here. Or more general, Time series data is continuous data, okay? So we have like either discrete data or continuous data, two types of data sets. Um, and time series data is a really important data because the output of most of the sensors and all of the sensors that we have these days is time series. So we can easily say that uh, the new big data or the real big data is time series data. I'm gonna give you some examples. Like the first one is EKG, electrocardiogram of heartbeats, uh, is a perfect example for, you know, for, for time series. Uh, these two examples here uh, are like accelerometer data, accelerometer sensors from uh, smartwatch and smartphone. Uh, they have like three dimensions, uh, similar to gyroscope as well and compass. Uh, these are perfect example of time series. Stock prices, the stock price changes like every uh, like few seconds, right? So if you plot it, you'll simply see a time series. Um, the reason that I put this up is because I want to talk about a few interesting projects that, is that are using t time series data and also some algorithms that you can apply onto time series data. Well, this is the, one of the projects. I was driving back home from Stanford. Every like Thursday, I drive home from there. And at some point in the freeway, I fall into a hole or like a, it's a very huge bump, you know? And it's really disturbing. And this happens like every week because I forget, okay? So I was wondering like, can we somehow store accelerometer data and geolocation data at the, at the same time so that next time my, my phone can t give me a notification and tell me, watch out, like in half a mile, you're going to fall into a big hole. And we actually did it. So we created this app which uh, monitors the accelerometer and geolocation at the same time. And for example, this is the z-axis of the accelerometer. So if you uh, put your phone, for example, on the dashboard like this, if you go on a bump, the z-axis will you know, show some, peak, some peaks, right? Uh, so for example, these two peaks at the beginning shows two bumps that I'm driving on. Here's the first one, and then here's the second one. Okay, very simple. But again, this shows that you know the use cases of uh, a lot of built-in sensors that you have in your smartwatch and in your smartphone available right now. You can use them for uh, so many different applications. Uh, this is another project we did for, with uh, collaboration with the psychology department at University of Texas at Dallas. They, in order to improve and assist people with speech disorders, they put 12 accelerometer sensors on a user's uh, mouth, tongue, and lips, and 
ask the users to speak out some words, and then at the same time, they were recording accelerometer data. So that means for every spoken word, we also had the corresponding accelerometer data, right? Using that data, we built a classifier that would be able to automatically classify the words given the time series data with 98% accuracy. That simple. If you want to get more details, you can find it here in this published paper that we published last year, 2017. ECG is a very electrocardiogram of heartbeats. Is again, uh, one of those really big data sets that there's a lot of potential for extracting information out of it. Uh, again, we started a project which, uh, using patients' ECG, we want to predict a heart attack. So for example, if some sort of patterns are, are observed in the ECG, your wearable device can tell you that, oh, you're going to get a heart attack, okay, like next week. Just imagine if this happens. This may happen sometime soon. But, I mean, obviously, we have to be very careful about false positives because, I mean, if your watch tells you that, okay, you're going to get a heart attack next week, you'll get a heart attack right away, right? So there, we have to handle this in a, you know, a smarter way, maybe like send a notification to your cardiologist, and then your cardiologist can ask you to go there for uh, taking an ECG. Uh, has anyone seen this one? This is a startup company in Silicon Valley, Cardia, Alloy of Core. They have built this very simple, portable uh, ECG sensor, which um, all you have to do is put two of your fingers on it, and it will record your ECG accurately. And then it will do some analysis and tell you whether your ECG is normal or not. And so we don't really need those stickers with all those you know, wires hanging out. Uh, it's very simple. I mean, we're, we're getting this. this uh, is actually FDA approved by the United States government. And um, it has a very cool app. Uh, it, what it, it will, you, you will actually record your ECG data and all of this data is gonna be stored into your I, iCloud account. And so that means that your cardiologist can log in and look into all of your ECG measurements just to make sure that everything is going fine, okay? This is actually the future of healthcare. It's gonna happen sometime soon. Um, you're just going to be sitting at home, having your robot device, your watch on your wrist with tons of sensors and monitoring your health 24-7. And anything, any, any time that something comes up suspicious, it, can, it will send you a notification or send a, you know, a, or maybe a notification to your medical uh, doctor. And there's even a lot of, you know, news on, uh, about Apple Watch, like how this heart rate sensor that is already integrated into the watch has saved lives. People have noticed some very high unusual heart rates and they went to the cardiologist and uh, there were, a lot of them were you know, diagnosed with some problem. All right, let's, get, let's switch into a different world, market analytics, and see again how data science can help save money. Amazon Go, does everyone know what Amazon Go is? How many people know what it is? Please raise your hand. I think like half of the, the crowd. So Amazon Go is uh, the, the store called like Grab and Go store, which Amazon set up in downtown Seattle, I think eight months ago. Like the first store, they also set up one in Silicon Valley uh, a few weeks ago. You're gonna go in, into the store, so there's no cashiers, there's no lines, nothing. You just grab your items and then run away. What happens is all of the items are gonna be automatically put on your card and they will be charged. Your card, credit card will be charged automatically. So they're using sensors, video, and applying computer vision, deep learning, and machine learning algorithms in order to understand and detect the, the items that you pick up. It's so smart that even if you pick up an item and then put it back, it notice, it will notice. And you know, Amazon is like super smart here because they're monitoring the, you know, the customer's behavior. For example, if you grab an item and put it back, Amazon knows that you're kind of interested in this item. So they're gonna send a coupon to your house before you get home. So that means next time you're gonna buy it, right? Uh, another smart move Amazon made this year, they uh, acquired Whole Food. Whole Food is one of these like chain uh, supermarkets that sells organic stuff in the US. It's one of the biggest. Uh, and it, it's kind of obvious what Amazon wants to do. They kind of wanna you know, install this whole Amazon Go technology onto Whole Foods. If they do that, I would say, all other supermarket or chain stores are gonna go bankrupt. I mean, the same thing that happened for other department stores that Amazon did this with, you know, like Target. Well, Target is not bankrupted yet, but they're close to bankrupt. 
A Sears, totally bankrupted just because of Amazon. Walmart was going bankrupt, but they just came back to the market. Um, here's a story about, I want to talk about an algorithm that is the most influential algorithm market analysis and is widely used. It's called association rule mining. Uh, a few years ago, Target, which was one of these department stores, uh, some guy went into the store and started yelling and shouting at the store's manager and said, why do you guys send pregnancy coupons to my teenage girl? And, you know, the store's manager apologizes and says, we're sorry, this is never ever going to happen again. But, like, after a few weeks, the store's manager calls the dad to follow up on this and say again, we're so sorry that this happened. And the dad says, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't know. My teenage girl was actually pregnant. So how did Target understand that this guy's teenage girl is pregnant before the dad understood? Well, the answer is association rule mining. Based on some rule that they learned from users' transactions and customers' transactions, if a customer purchased 19 items together, not necessarily in one single transaction, maybe like over like a, a few weeks uh, period of time, it means they're pregnant, okay? So that brings up this topic, market basket analysis and also association rule mining that I was talking about. The output of this algorithm is going to be looking like, like this. Like customers who bought this item also bought these items, okay? So there's so many applications for this because, like, here's some examples. Like store layout, it's going to help, you know, all of the mar supermarkets to, uh, you know, lay out and put all the items that are related to each other next to each other so the customers can, you know, pick, pick all of them together for marketing purposes, for coupons, recommendations, recommender engines, and so on and so forth. Um, there's, so, again, so many applications like in Amazon, Spotify, Facebook, Netflix, Google, they're all, all of these recommendations that you see are coming from this association rule mining algorithm. Or for example, in Amazon, once you, uh, you, you put an item in your basket, you will see something like customers who bought this item also bought these items, right? You've probably seen this a lot. Again, this is one of the outputs of this algorithm. Um, so again, going back to association rule mining, the output of this algorithm looks like, like this. For example, this is based on true data. Most of the customers who purchase onions and, and, and potatoes also purchased burgers. Most of the customers who purchased flour and sugar purchased eggs. Why? They wanted to? Bake a cake, right? So some of these rules are pretty intuitive, right? You could even guess without applying association rule mining. But some of them are not, like this one. Most of the customers who purchase diapers and milk purchase Coke. For what reason? We have no idea. But it's happening, right? Most of the customers who like Apple products and play Pokemon Go like pasta. Well, I just made, made this up, but... Uh, <laughs> But the rest of the rules are based on true data. All right, let's get into another project, malaria detection. This is, I would say, the coolest project I've ever seen in my lifetime, OK? So I think it's really cool. It's really nice and very impactful. Um, well, over 1 million people die from malaria every year. And they're mostly children under the age of five, unfortunately. And 90% of malaria cases occur in Africa. This is a key point about malaria. In general, malaria is not going to kill anyone, okay? It's a curable disease, but if it's diagnosed and treated promptly. The problem in Africa is that people do not get diagnosed or do not get treated because there's no medical facilities there. That's why. That's why so many people and most of the casualties are happening in Africa these days. Now, in order to solve this problem, we need to understand the spread and the density of malaria over all Africa in real time. If we have that information somehow, it means that wherever malaria is like dense and there's a lot of malaria cases happening there, people or uh, charities can go and build medical facilities there and save tons of lives, okay? In order to get this information, there's two solutions. Number one, we train and send millions of entomologists all over Africa and then these guys, you know, sit down, sit, sit down and count the number of mosquitoes that are affected by malaria. Well, that's impossible. We probably don't even have one million entomologists around the globe. Number two, if we can build a very cheap, portable sensor device that could automatically count the number of mosquitoes affected by malaria, problem solved. And here it is. This 
device cost three bucks and is able to do this. Here's the whole idea. If you shine a laser beam, you, so you have this laser beam and a receiver, and the mosquito flies through the laser beam. Once that happens, you're going to see like some time series data here in the receiver, right? Because of the change of voltage. And you know, the pattern of this, these time series are great signatures and identifiers of the type of the mosquito, the gender of the mosquito, and whether it's carrying a, a, a virus like Zika or malaria. Okay? It's a classification problem. All you have to do is you have to train this model on like all species that you have, both genders, male and female, and also like a different class of malaria, non-malaria, Zika, non-Zika, and so on and so forth, and you can do it. So we did this in our lab. We trained, we collected, it took us like one year to collect data from 30 different species. And the model that we built was able to identify male from female with 99.9% .9 accuracy for the mosquitoes. And uh, so it was, it was working very well. This time series here, this crazy time series here is reflecting a lot of features from the, uh, from the mosquito. For example, the frequency of the wing beats, the shape of the wings, the size of the mosquito, they're all reflected into that time series. Well, so this whole idea was my, my PhD advisor, I mean, he was the guy, all the credit goes to him, he was the guy who came up with this idea. We just helped him for implementation. And uh, he put up this uh, company called farmsense.io, which are uh, building these you know, portable devices. And this could also not, not only use, not, uh, use uh, only for um, malaria, it could also, you, you know, farmers can also set it up in their farms in order to understand the type of mosquitoes that are flying around their farms, you know, for choosing the right pest and, uh, and, and you know, taking care of their whole farm. I also put up his photo here, Eamon. He's, he's one of the greatest advisors on earth, I would say. Uh, if you have any questions about this project, you can directly contact him. I put up his email in the slides. And also, here's the link to this uh, uh, startup company, which you can get more information about it. After we started working on this project, Microsoft Research approached our lab and discussed a very interesting project that they are working on. They are going to build a drone that is able to capture mosquitoes in the air and sequence the blood inside the mosquito in order to understand the different species that are living in that area and also if, you know, if there's any outbreaking diseases, you know, to kind of like understand and prevent that you know, from outbreaking. Um, but, so this project is going to be launched in 2025, like seven years from now. But, you know, the blood sequencing is the most expensive part and it takes a lot of time. You know, these guys claim that uh, after like seven years from now, they're going to be able to do this in 12 hours inside the drone. But that's still a lot of time. But using the sensor laser technology that I discussed right now, you can instantly get some very useful information from the mosquito by just shining the laser, right? Just by shining the laser, you can instantly understand the gender, the type of the mosquito, if it's carrying any, any virus, and so on and so forth. Here's a short video that explains and talks about this project. I'm going to show you, oops, sorry. All right, so you'll be seeing this project coming out soon. Not soon, well, seven years from now, but. All right, my last topic that I wanted to discuss is about 
prediction or in general predictive modeling. It's one of the most you know important algorithms in data science, right? And also machine learning. And specifically, I'm going to talk about like prediction and time series because we talked about you know the importance of time series data. Uh, so predictive modeling techniques and you know algorithms have it, are, have existed uh, like for maybe 40 years. Okay, they're very old, but on discrete data. But for time series data, it's something new. Okay. And, uh, but here's an example on discrete data. Again, we did this project for Bosch uh, a few years ago. Did you know that 60% of the revenue of Bosch comes from auto parts? That's unbelievable, right? I mean, I always thought that they make money out of like dishwashers or fridges, but apparently that's not the case. Like 60% of the revenue comes from auto parts. So they had like a huge data set of different auto parts that they sell to German companies and also other uh, automakers. And also the number of you know, demand for each of them and the number that they sold, the number they had in warehouses and so on and so forth. And they wanted us to predict the demand for every auto part in the next, in the next six months. Okay. This is a simple problem, right? It's just like traditional predictive modeling on discrete data. You have like a bunch of numbers and you can predict what's gonna happen next. But the main challenge is, the challenging part is making predictions and time series data. It's not an easy task, okay? This is not a very well-known problem, surprisingly. Uh, we actually published a paper in 2015 that um, introduces a novel algorithm that is able to automatically detect the most meaningful patterns and rules in time series data in order to make predictions, okay? And, I mean, there's no other work before this that would do this automatically or, uh, or directly on time series data. Most of the older techniques would you know, discretize data and then just use predictive modeling on discrete data. So what is the use case? I mean, why should we really care about this? Well, I'm gonna talk, call this rule discovery or short-term prediction. Uh, so by short-term prediction, I mean like, if, we just, if we're able just to like predict one millisecond out of time, is that useful or not? Well, it, it really is. For example, if a robot would be able to understand and predict if it's gonna fall down in one millisecond ahead of time. Well, it can prevent that fall. Or for example, if auto cars, if cars could use all their sensors and apply machine learning and learn if a car accident is gonna happen like in half a second ahead of time. They can open the airbags automatically, they can press the brake, they can fasten the seat belt, you know, and save lives easily. And this is not something imaginary. It's something that is happening right now. Tesla is claiming that they're doing this. I'm going to show you, show you a short video. It's uh, taken from a Tesla, inside a Tesla, and um, you will hear the beep before the accident happens. So it's happening. And just to wrap up the this presentation, well, zebra finch, I know, I mean, what, what does zebra finch have to do with predictions and data science? Uh, in the 2015 paper that I pointed out in the pre previous slide, uh, we apply this algorithm on multiple data sets in different modalities and different domains, just to show that this algorithm is working and it's able to extract meaningful rules and, and predictions. One of the data sets that I really like is zebra finch. Okay. Zebra Finch is a very cute, beautiful creature that sings repetitively with repetitive patterns. So we thought, okay, let's go and run this algorithm on the Zebra Finch, Zebra Finch's singing patterns and see how it looks like. Uh, so in order to do this, well, you need to convert audio file into time series data, right? There's a well-known algorithm, a very common algorithm called MFCC. So if you run MFCC on audio files, the output is gonna be like 13 dimensions of time series. And then we grab like one of the dimensions and we ran this algorithm on this data and we found, uh, and the algorithm told us that this is the most meaningful pattern. So this orange subsequence me is called the antecedent and the, and the green one is called the consequent. So it means that anywhere in the data, anywhere inside the audio file, if this orange subsequence is observed, if the antecedent is observed, the consequent is gonna be seen after. In other words, I'm also gonna play the audio for you. So if a zebra finch sings this, they're gonna sing 
this afterwards. Okay? So we predicted what they're going to sing. Isn't that interesting? Well, again, it's probably not groundbreaking. You know, who cares like, what zebra finches are singing about? But it was just like proof of demonstration. All right, thank you so much for your time. Obrigado, and thank you so much for having me here. Thanks, Mohammed. Do we have any questions from the audience for Mohammed? Hi. Um, if you have a multi vector of data sets, like multiple variable in the, in the time series, how do you con consider the, the correlation between different, different entities? That's a very good question, but that's a very challenging problem. Because um, that's something, so after we published this paper, we started working on this. Because there's so many applications for this. For example, if, if you have like weather data, like humidity and temperature at the same time, and then if you want to predict if it's going to rain or not. So you have like two different time series, two different domains, and you want to understand this. Uh, so this problem has not been solved yet, I mean, to the best of my knowledge. But we have been working on this for some time. Any other questions? Okay, in that case, thanks very much, Mohammed. Another round of applause, please. Okay, we're going to take a quick break, but make sure you're back here at 4.40 for our next talk. Thank you.